Purgatory, Chapter 26 The Duration of Purgatory Let us cite some other examples which will serve to convince us still more of the long duration of the sufferings of Purgatory. We shall see therein that divine justice is relatively severe towards souls called to perfection, and who have received much grace. Does not Jesus Christ say in the Gospel, Unto whom much is given, of him much shall be required? And to whom they have committed much, of him they will demand the more. Luke 12.48 We read in the life of the venerable Catherine Paluzzi that a holy religious who died in her arms was not admitted to eternal beatitude until she had passed an entire year in purgatory. Catherine Paluzzi led a holy life in the diocese of Nepi in Italy, where she found a convent of Dominicans. There lived with her a religious named Bernadine, who was far advanced in the way of the spiritual life. These two saints emulated each other in fervor, and helped each other to progress more and more in the perfection which God called them. The biographer of Venerable Catherine compares them to two live coals that communicate heat to each other, and again to two harps tuned to harmonize together in one perpetual hymn of love to the greater glory of God. Bernadine died a painful malady, which she bore with Christian patience, carried her to her grave. When about to expire, she told Catherine that she would not forget her before God, and if God so permitted, she would return to converse with her on such spiritual matters as would contribute to her sanctification. Catherine prayed much for the soul of her friend, and at the same time besought God to allow her to appear to her. An entire year elapsed, and the deceased did not return. Finally, on the anniversary of the death of Bernadine, Catherine, being in prayer, saw a pit from whence issued volumes of smoke and flames. Then she perceived, coming out of the pit, a form surrounded by dark clouds. By degrees these vapors were dispersed, and the apparition became radiant with an extraordinary brilliancy. In this glorious personage, Catherine recognized Bernadine and ran towards her. "'Is it you, my dearest sister?' said she. But when do you come? What signifies this pit, this fiery smoke? Does your purgatory end only today? You are right, replied the soul, for a year I have been detained in that place of expiation, and today, for the first time, I shall enter heaven. As regards yourself, persevere in your holy exercises, continue to be charitable and merciful, and you will obtain mercy." The following incident belongs to the history of the Society of Jesus. Two scholastics of young religious of that institute, brothers Finiti and Rudolfini, pursued their studies at the Roman College towards the end of the 16th century. Both were models of piety and regularity. Both also received a warning from heaven, which they disclosed according to the rule to their spiritual director. God made known to them that their approaching death and the sufferings that awaited them in purgatory. One was to remain there for two years, the other four. They died, in fact, one after the other. Their brethren in religion immediately offered the most fervent prayers and all kinds of penances for the repose of their souls. They knew that if the sanctity of God imposes them long expiations upon his elect, they may be abridged and entirely remitted by the suffrages of the living. If God is severe towards those who have received much knowledge and grace, on the other hand, he is very indulgent towards the poor and the simple, provided they serve him with sincerity and patience. St. Peter Claver of the Company of Jesus, Apostle of the Negroes of Carthagena, knew of the purgatory of two souls, who had led poor and humble lives upon earth. Their sufferings were reduced to a few hours. We find the following account of it in their life, of that great servant of God. He had persuaded a virtuous negress named Angela 
to take into her house another negress named Ursula, who had lost the use of her limbs and was covered with sores. One day when he visited them, as he did time to time, to hear confessions and to carry them some little provisions, the charitable hostess told them with grief that Ursula was at the point of death. No, no, replied the father, consoling her, she's yet four days to live, and she will not die until Saturday. When Saturday came, he said mass for her intention, and went out to prepare her for her death. After spending some time in prayer, he said to the hostess with an air of confidence, Be consoled, God loves Ursula. She will die today, but she will be only three hours in purgatory. Let her remember me when she shall be with God, that she may pray for me and for the one who until now had been a mother to her. She died at noon, and the fulfillment on the part of the prophecy had a great reason for belief in the accomplishment of the other. Another day, having gone to hear the confession of a poor sick person whom he was accustomed to visit, he learned that she was dead. The parents were extremely afflicted, and he himself, who had not believed her to be so near her end, was inconsolable at the thought of not having been able to assist her in her last moments. He knelt down to pray by the corpse, then suddenly rising, with a serene countenance, he said, Such a death is more worthy of our envy than our tears. This soul is condemned to purgatory, but for only twenty-four hours. Let us endeavor to shorten this time by the fervor of our prayers. Enough has been said on the duration of the pains. We see that they may be prolonged to an appalling degree, even the shortest, if we consider their severity or long. Let us endeavor to shorten them by others and to mitigate them for ourselves, or better still, to prevent them altogether. Now we prevent them by removing the causes. What are the causes? What is the matter of expiation in purgatory? Purgatory, Chapter 27 The Cause of Suffering Matter of Expiations of Purgatory Doctrine of Suarez St. Catherine of Genoa Why must souls thus suffer before being admitted to see the face of God? What is the matter? What is the subject of these expiations? What is the fire of purgatory to purify, to consume in them? It is, says the doctors, the stains left by their sins. But what here is understood by stains? According to most theologians, it is not the guilt of sin, but the pain or the debt of pain proceeding from sin. To understand this well, we must remember that sin produces a double effect on our soul, which we call the debt of guilt and the debt of pain. It renders the soul not guilty, but deserves of pain or chastisement. Now after the guilt is pardoned, it generally happens that the pain remains to be undergone, either entirely or in part, and this must be endured either in the present life or in the life to come. The souls in purgatory retain not the slightest stain of guilt. The venial guilt, which they had at the moment of their death, has disappeared in the order of pure charity with which they are inflamed in the other life, but they still bear the debt of suffering, which they have not discharged before death. This debt proceeds from the, all the faults committed during their life, especially from mortal sins remitted as to the guilt, but which they have neglected to expiate by worthy fruits of exterior penance. Such is the common teachings of theologians, which Suarez sums up in his treatise on the sacrament of penance. We conclude then, he says, that all venial sins with which a just man dies are remitted as to the guilt. We conclude then, he says, that all venial sins with which a just man dies are remitted as to the guilt at the moment when the soul is separated from the body by virtue of an act of love of God and the perfect contrition 
which it then excites over all its past faults. In fact, the soul at this moment knows its condition perfectly. All the sins of which it has been guilty before God, at the same time, it is mistress of its faculties to be able to act. On the other hand, on the part of God, the most efficacious helps are given to her, that she may act according to the measure of sanctifying grace which she possesses. It follows, then, that in this perfect disposition, the soul acts without the least hesitation. It turns directly towards its God, and finds itself free from all its venial sins by an act of sovereign loathing of sin. This universal and efficacious act suffices for the remission of their guilt. All stain of guilt has then disappeared, but the pain remains to be endured in all its rigor and long duration, at least for those souls who are not assisted by the living. They cannot obtain the least relief for themselves because the time of merit has passed. They can no longer merit. They can but suffer, and in that way pay to the terrible justice of God all that we owe, even to the last farthing. Matthew 526. These depths of pain are the remains of sin, and a kind of stain which intercepts the vision of God, and places an obstacle to the union of the soul with its last end. Since the souls in purgatory are free from the guilt of sin, writes St. Catherine of Genoa, there is no other barrier between them and their union with God, save the remains of sin, from which they must be purified. This hindrance which they feel within them causes them to suffer the torments of the damned, of which I have spoken elsewhere, and retards the moment when the instinct by which they are drawn towards God as to their sovereign beatitude will attain its full perfection. They see clearly how serious before God is even the slightest obstacle raised by the remains of sin and that it is by necessity of justice that he delays the full gratification of their desire of everlasting bliss. This sight enkindles within them a burning flame, like that of hell, yet without the guilt of sin.